Hey there, you know who this is. This is Marvin, the Parenting Podcast here, your English-speaking parenting podcast from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam. And we're on a little summer break, so we thought we will dig into our archives and dig out the episodes that resonated most with our listeners. And one of them was episode 25, where we invited Eowyn Chrisfield from On Raising Bilingual Children to the table to have a conversation how to raise global citizens, so how to navigate multilingualism in our families, how to help our children best when they navigate the whole big adventure of speaking multiple languages, how we can implement them at home, what the basis is actually for their language requirement and for their language acquisition and how you can navigate this whole journey. So take a good listen what Eowyn has to share with us. If you want to make sure that you help us spread the word about this important topic, like, share and subscribe to our podcast, Damn Parenting Podcast on YouTube. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are also on Instagram, Damn Parenting Podcast. Make sure to connect with us, to leave us some feedback, give us a five-star review on your podcast player. So we are getting rated, we are getting seen, we are getting discovered by other parents who are longing for this information that we put out there. I hope you enjoy this episode. If you're re-listening to it, maybe you refresh your memory, or if this is the first time where you listen to this topic, that you get all All the gems that Eowyn had to share with us and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi everyone and welcome back to Damn Parenting, your English-speaking parenting podcast from Amsterdam. And as you know, we are your hosts Maren and Eva. Today we are talking multilingualism, which is quite a tongue tangler for me, and bilingualism in children because it is, Eva, you are in charge of all the weeks and celebration dates. Is multilingual week or day or what are we celebrating with Lego? <laughs> <laughs> is International Mother Language Day. Okay. And yeah, so basically it's a case of celebrating our mother language, but actually in effect what we what we're going to learn in this episode is actually its own language is how we're going to actually say it. Yes, and this episode we thought is of course because we are running an English speaking podcast for expats in the Netherlands highly wanted and asked for and of course all these questions of so I am speaking this language to my child. My partner speaks this and then Nana and Grandma and Opa speak that and then they go to school here and how are we managing all these languages so this episode is for everyone who was questioning am i doing this right i was questioning because i'm not a linguist i have had one semester of linguistics failed the exams and that was that with me and the lingo so i was just doing a little research here and there and frantically like googling one phrase is this okay do you raise a bilingual child like that or one person one language approach like all these questions that we have raising our children in a multilingual environment and hopefully with this episode we will put a lot of ahas and wows and a lot of ease into your brain and into your self-confidence we brought Eowyn on and she is actually is she running a platform what is she what's her profession Eowyn she's actually a linguistic she's actually living in England and she's uh, teaching their linguistics but she also set up on raising bilingual children here in the Netherlands because she was living in The Hague for 15 years she left about six years ago I think she said yeah she's got a couple of people here who are actually still uh, helping people out locally She, a woman of mystery because she's actually doing quite a lot, even with government policies, with linguistics. I mean, she's out there and she's trying to make a difference in helping the world as we develop with the multilingualists and the fact that, you know, like yourself, you speak one language, your husband speaks another and you're living in the Netherlands. I mean, three different languages. This didn't yeah. happen much in the past, but it's now happening so frequently that we need to upscale and develop new strategies and policies in place. Yeah. And Eowyn really, I'm putting this in very blank words, knows her shit. Like she knows everything about raising bilingual children, addressing the topics and questions that parents might have. So hopefully you will get a little bit of insight of what she has to offer. And of course, her, I, she also wrote a book. And if you want to connect with someone here in Amsterdam, there is also one person here in Amsterdam. Her name is Mimi. And she's been to the Mama Social Brunches. That's how we got to know her. And we thought, let's bring on these people to have a chat about language. 
And we hope you find this as informative as Eva and I did and you enjoy this really highly asked expert interview with someone who really knows what's going on with the languages. So enjoy. Field from raising bilingual kids on Instagram and also on the podcast. Awen, thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Today we are celebrating international mother language, as it were, and we reached out to yourself to talk about this as obviously international people living abroad, there's a lot of issues basically that can raise in a house and concerns for parents about how we're going to do this. So I think the first thing that we're going to start off with is firstly, will you introduce yourself so we kind of get a feel for who you are and where you come from and why we've invited you on? My name is Aaron Crisfield. I am Canadian born and raised and I have a background background in applied linguistics, which is the teaching and learning of languages and bilingualism in societies. And so over the course of my master's and my PhD, I specialized particularly in the development of bilingualism in children's homes and in schools. And so I've been working in this field for quite a long time, working with families on family language planning, working with schools on provisions for multilingual children, and working with various kind of governmental organizations on language policy. This is uh, how I spend my life. I also work part-time at a university in the UK as a senior lecturer in English language and TESOL. So that's my academic side still. So you really know your lingo in and out. <laughs> by, the, by this point, all my family knows my lingo. <laughs> and this is I've the taken, reason why we have her here. <laughs> I've taken one semester of English linguistics. I failed the exam and that's when my history with linguistic ended. So I'm very <laughs> delighted to always hear when people stuck with it and, as it seems, found their passion in this field. I did. I always say I'm very lucky. I found my ikigai, which is a Japanese concept of the crossover of what you love to do, what the world needs, and what you can make a living at. Yeah, we got to reach that with this triangle. podcast. <laughs> yeah. So first, I think we'll quickly address, so it's International Mother Day, as I said, and this year's theme is the multilingual education and necessity to transform education. You've just mentioned yourself that you've been working with governments and policies, but for this, we were really focusing actually on the home language topic. We'll start with the first question, which will be, how do you define home language? So as you know already from your brief bit of research, that it's quite complex how we talk about languages, different terms are used in different places to mean the same thing. Um, and so kind of consistently, I work with the term home language, meaning any language that's spoken in the home from a very young age. So the language of the caregivers, the language of the, you know, the grandparents, if they live with you, anybody who's involved in a child's linguistic upbringing from birth or from a young age. Okay, so for example, in my instance, I'm with a Dutch man. And so my daughter was raised with English, a bit of Irish and Dutch. So then English, a bit of Irish and Dutch are her home languages. And you can see immediately why we needed to move away from the term mother tongue, because a child can only have one mother tongue and then two of your child, your daughter's languages would be left out under that. And so, you know, this is why we've reframed, if you will, the terminology we use, because we realized that using the kind of the term mother tongue was reductive. And really, we ended up missing a lot of pieces of the puzzle for children's development. That's why I was frantically researching, thinking, well, if it's my mother tongue, yet my daughter is speaking better Dutch and a lot more Dutch, <laughs> I was getting confused as well on that terminology. So thank you for clearing that up. So we are talking about home languages now. I guess we could kind of just launch straight in and just ask, like, what are the critical periods, home languages, we should say, development for a child? So it's less about critical periods and more about what you kind of what your expectations are. But we do know that languages that a child learns from birth or from a very young age are encoded in a certain way in the brain. Uh, they have an ease of access. And we do know that for, for very young children, i.e. babies, learning two or more languages at the same time from birth doesn't seem to cause any particular delay or difficulty for them. So it's a really good way to become bilingual. And we know that there are positive effects kind of cognitively, linguistically and socially from being raised with more than one language as well. I think the, the kind of what what we see happening a lot amongst uh, multilingual families, especially mobile multilingual families, is that as children move out of the home into childcare or school settings, their use of their own home languages starts to diminish. And one of the things that we need to remember is that children can lose languages quite quickly and quite easily. And so if you speak, for example, Irish in your home with your child, and then they go off to school in Dutch and they start speaking to you in Dutch, so you start speaking to them in Dutch, the Irish 
will be gone within a couple of years. It may be kind of like it, it leaves kind of a ghost or an echo, if you will, but children can fundamentally lose the language that they have, you know, had first in their lives if we don't pay attention to the maintenance and development of it. We know that that can have long term impacts on their overall development. We know it can have long term impacts on their linguistic development. And of course, it has an impact on their kind of their community and their socialization as well. So one of the things you just touched upon there was actually you mentioned about language delay and that now there's been proven that even though people could children are raised with two languages or more, that there's actually not really a delay from the research that's been done, because this is a huge thing that a lot of, for example, the parents that I know here, that's always kind of a common issue or subject that people bring up like, oh, well, you know, you can expect this or, you know, this is going to happen because they've got two languages. So you've actually mentioned that there actually is none. No, there is no evidence that shows that children who are raised with more than one lingual f- language from birth have an actual language delay. What often is behind that myth is that for the first about four years of life, children will develop their vocabulary in a differential way. So the kinds of things they do with their mother using English will lead to certain vocabulary in English. But if they do Dutch, if they do other things in Dutch with the other parent, they won't necessarily cross over. And so if we only look at their vocabulary in one language, we think, oh, they haven't got as many words as they need to. And so we need to, for the first four years, look at the aggregate of their language skills. And then normally they're at, you know, they're on par or ahead of their monolingual peers. Um, but a child who has a speech, an actual diagnosed by a reliable professional who understands bilingual children, speech and language delay would have that even if they were monolingual. It's either physiological, so that's the speech sounds piece, and that isn't caused by being bilingual, or it's to do with their processing, which is the language piece. So not being able able to make, you know, phrases or fr- things like that. And and that again, that's that's to do with their cognitive functioning. It's nothing to do with being bilingual. I hope this is going to give people some peace of mind not to worry about a delay, not to expect a delay and not to focus so much on potentially having a delay. You were mentioning there about like one language, one parent, which is quite a common phrase as well, where the OP or the OLOP. So is this something that you definitely would suggest to people? Because I do know a lot of people are like, well, I live here, I speak Dutch anyway, so I'll just speak Dutch to my child because this is the environment we're in. So is this something that you would, from your research and your own experience? One parent, one language, OPAL, tends to be kind of touted as the ideal strategy. Uh, It's not. There is no ideal strategy. What you what you need to look at is the balance of languages, the balance of input in languages. And so, for example, if we take your family, you're the only English speaking parent. There's a Dutch speaking parent and Dutch is used outside the home. Your child is going to get far more Dutch than English using an Opal foundation, which means that they will develop far more in Dutch than in English. And so Opal works insofar as the language balance, the input balance stays reasonably similar. But as soon as Opal plus the community language use means that there's a weight towards the other one, then you end up with one language that is generally not as well developed. I'm not saying that that's a problem. A lot of children are, you know, most children are dominant in one language after about the age of four or five. Most bilinguals are dominant in one language. But if we really want our child to be kind of fully bilingual and to go on to, to read and write in both those languages, what we need to look at is an input strategy that gives the best balance. And so often in families, families like yours, I would say, you should probably be a minority language at home, which is that you and your partner both use English with your child at home, and then they get all that Dutch outside, and then you get more of a balance. Now, it requires the, you know, the the agreement of both both parents, but but what you're looking at is this idea that children learn language from what we call CDI, child-directed input. So an adult speaking to them. And if the CDI is significantly lower in one language than another, that will appear in the child's proficiency as well. They'll become what we call often a passive or receptive bilingual in one of the languages, especially if they know our oh, mom understands me when I speak Dutch anyway, so I don't have to work so hard to use the other language. And so, you know, for me, saying that you should only speak your own language with a child, first of all, is false, but you should stick to the language that you are prioritizing in your particular family language plan. And so if you as the minority language parent start using Dutch with your child, it will have an impact on their English development, not because you're not a native Dutch speaker, not because of any of those other mythical reasons, but because they'll be getting less English. So if we take a different approach, so that would be marriage, for example, 
Maren is German and her partner is American and they're in the Netherlands. How would you suggest with that aspect? That's cool. Yes. Be. Yeah. So I speak German with my child. My husband speaks English. However, he does understand perfect German and also speaks German. Our family language is English. When the adults speak, we speak English. And then she has Dutch only outside of the home. So with a family like yours, what you're probably getting is a more equal spread across the three. Mm -hmm. And so each parent doing their own language in Dutch outside is probably getting a nice balance. What some families like to do is they like to use each other's languages. So they have a more feeling of a family language strategy. And so that would mean your partner using German and you using English. And so you can use what we call a domains of use strategy where you agree, for example, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we use, we all use German every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we all use English. Mm -hmm. Sundays, mm -hmm. we do whatever we want. Or, you know, evenings, we all have dinner together in German to make sure that the German keeps up. In a family like yours, what we would likely see happening from about school age onwards is that the English will start overtaking the German because English is more present in the Netherlands and English is the language that all kids are motivated to learn. They'll have friends who speak English, they'll have, you know, TV, they'll have all that kind of presence of English means that English soon starts to take a bigger and bigger place. And then the minority language, which in your case is German, takes less of a place. And so you may find that you need to rethink your strategy when your mm. child is seven or eight years old because you can feel that the German is not keeping pace yeah. with the English and Dutch. The one thing that I have noticed, and I am mostly with my daughter, so she gets more exposure to German right now. However, she speaks English with her dad, but she uses the German syntax a lot of the times when she speaks English. And I was always worried that her English is going to get weak and weak, but now I'm hearing the opposite, that actually her German is going to be a loser in this. Um, yeah, event yeah so eventually, yes, but it's really great that you're the primary parent right now at home, because so, you'll give her a really strong foundation in German before the, mm -hmm. you know, the English starts increasing and the Dutch starts increasing. And if we notice, because I'm not sure what to do like with her syntax, is it better to correct her or to just reply in the correct way? I'm like just not reply sure. in the correct way. Okay. Bilingual children, they're, you know, when we think about what the brain of a, a bilingual or multilingual child looks like, we have to imagine an iceberg and underneath the water is everything they know about how language works and above the water is the bits that sound like German, the bits that sound like English and the bits that sound like Dutch. And so when young children especially communicate, they're not stopping to think about, am I choosing the right code? They're just communicating. And so mm -hmm. you get this and, and they're really skillful at it. If you pay attention to your children and the way they mix their languages, you'll find that they'll, they'll put the right accent on a word in the wrong language. My my daughter once said to me, Maman, je veux un towel. <laughs> so obviously, <laughs> towel is not a French word. And then she knew instinctively that she'd have to pronounce it differently to be French. And so they're really linguistically skillful. What they're doing is they're communicating and they're drawing on all that reserves of the underneath of the iceberg to communicate. And if we slow them down and stop them and correct them, we're essentially making them less likely to communicate with us. And so we really need to take a very positive attitude and we need to think about like if you're like, so I didn't say to her, uh, I said, oh, tu veux une serviette? Oh, you want it? And I gave her the word back in French and we just kept going. And so that's called recasting giving them back what they were missing in a natural way and, and then keep going because, you know, especially for young children, communication is key and they don't think in codes in the way we do when we're older. So if we look at this aspect of the home language, um, how can parents balance the importance of the home language with, with the necessity of children having to learn Dutch uh, living here in the <laughs> Netherlands? The home languages are the foundation that everything is built on. The home languages are the primary language of cognitive development for the child. So they're the first language their brain has started developing in. All of those things we're doing with our young children that seem really basic and boring to us, it's all helping their brain develop. And so if their brain is developing in English and in German, for example, and we do a good job with that, the Dutch will build on it. We know there's a really strong relationship between the level of development of the dominant language from home and their level of development in the new language. So 
what parents need to do most is just continue to develop the home languages. And if you get those right, the Dutch will come. It's if you endanger the home languages that then the Dutch struggles as well because you're essentially weakening their cognitive system. And so when we look kind of globally at education systems where children are taught in a language other than their first, so across the African continent, a lot of times education still is in the colonial language. When we suppress a child's home language in favor of a new language, we know it has negative cognitive effects, negative linguistic effects, and negative academic effects. And so who's emphasized to parents, your job is the home languages. If you get those right, the Dutch will come. But sometimes that requires actually having a real strength of conviction about what you're doing, because it is quite common for parents to be told, you should stop speaking your language at home and start speaking Dutch instead, which is at best misguided and at worst really damaging to children. And so it can be hard for parents faced with a Dutch school or any school. I'm not problematizing the Netherlands more than anywhere else, but it's quite common for the education sector to say, well, your child needs to use the, you know, use the school language at home too. But that's really the wrong thing to do, but it's it's quite commonly given as advice. So how would you suggest that parents can create a supportive language environment then at home, which is encouraging their children to value both the languages then at home, both parents and also in schools? So it's about modeling a lot of it. Part of it's about modeling. And so, for example, if you speak to your child in German all the time when you're at home and you walk out the door and you switch to Dutch, you've just told your child you think Dutch is more important than German. Oh, wow. Sorry, okay. myself and Maren both had I know you're here there. <laughs> Draws are dropping. So the choices you're making, they're yeah. processing and going, oh, well, you know, I worked with a, a family many, many years ago in the Netherlands, in The Hague, the mother was Russian and the father was Dutch. And they came to me because at six years old, the little girl had stopped speaking Russian. She could, she just wouldn't. So I said to her, I think Russian is a really interesting language. Could you speak Russian with me? She said, oh, no, I can't. I said, why not? And she said, because Russian is a secret language. Why do you say that? And she said, because mommy always speaks Russian to me, but as, some, as soon as someone else comes in the room, she changes to Dutch. Hmm. Okay. That so little kids' smart. brains. Oh my but, God. You know, they process things differently. And so yeah. part of it's what we're modeling and part of it's the conversations we have with them about the importance of the home languages, the importance of Dutch at school and in the community. Like really, we have to have those conversations from, you know, 18 months to two and a half years old. We start having those conversations with children when we say things like, yeah, that's the word daddy uses. Mummy says cheese and daddy says cats. And so we're showing they're equally valuable. It's also, you know, something that parents who are, you know, temporarily in the Netherlands need to think about. If they're taking their children into the shops and using only English and then telling their children you should be using more Dutch. Well, mm -hmm. you know what you're more, then you have to have that conversation. Why do you not use Dutch in the cheese shop, but you expect them to be using Dutch at school? And so we have to have ongoing conversations with our children about our family language planning and priorities. And we need to contextualize for them our own decisions. Otherwise, they will just figure it out themselves and, and it may not be, you know, accurate. This is, yeah, so funny when you, that you mentioned this because this is exactly what happens when we're at the doctor or somewhere. And my Dutch is very limited, to put it that way. And especially in a medical setting, I want to speak English because I want to make sure I get everything. Mm -hmm. I do say, oh, yeah, she speaks Dutch. And then they start speaking Dutch to her. She will not respond in Dutch or even pretend to understand when I am in the room because she sees I'm speaking English. Right. And I was always yeah. so, okay, how can I make this work? But this, yeah, of course, total sense, makes absolute sense. <laughs> Okay. And then if we look at our extended families, so we're all living here without our extended families, as it were, what ways can we use our extended families to be involved in supporting our children's home languages, I guess, or our mother tongues, as it were, for our own families with that language development? So there's nothing more painful than sitting on Zoom and trying to get your toddler to talk to their grandparents. <laughs> yep. We've all been in that pain. We've all <laughs> been in that pain. <laughs> I would say that the, the, the kind of the, the best thing that you can do is take an interactive approach. So for example, have family members who are far away and you're on Zoom with them reading a story and you have a copy of the book in front of you for the child to see and they have a copy that they're holding up and talking through and that they stop and ask questions um you know anything that's interactive like that will get a child's attention more there's you know there's there's not enough research about the impact of child directed input through like a zoom call but we do know for example when it comes to language acquisition screens d screens do not work 
for young children. So there was, for example, a very big study in California some years ago, working with children, well, babies from one to two years old. They gave them one year of Mandarin, an hour a day. And one of the groups, it was an hour a day in person. And the other group, it was exactly the same person, exactly the same stuff, an hour a day through a screen. And then they measured their outcomes. And the children who did it through a screen, it was like they'd never heard a word of Mandarin. What? Yeah. Yes. Okay, myself oh my God. I'm admiring, blown away again. A lot of times parents think, oh, I'm going to put the TV on in my language and that will help. Only if you're sitting and talking with them about what Bob the Bauer is doing. Um, wow. You know, they that's that CDI, that child directed input for the first year has to, of course, four years, sorry, up to about four years old. It's like actually talking to them. And so that's why in homes like Marin, so the parents use English together, the mom mm. uses German and the dad uses English. She's not necessarily... The, not paying attention to what the parents do together. It's what you do with directly with the child. And so a lot of times families say, you know, I'm French and my husband's German and we use English together. The child needs all three. No, they don't. They need French and German. <laughs> and mm. then the English as the family language will come when they're older, but they're not going to be picking it up because you're talking about the movie you watched with your spouse in English. It does, you know, just doesn't work that way. So if we're having a conversation, like if my my dad rings like every day, if he could. So we sit down and we have a chat with him and he always asks the same questions. Very adorable, but, you know, totally old school. And I can see she's kind of like, yeah, it's just that thing that I'm like, are you because it's a conversation. It's not sitting down yeah. and just watching TV and therefore just observing. This is an actual interaction. I thought this therefore would be a more positive thing. But they just don't connect in the same way through a screen. It's very difficult for young children to abstract in that way. But there's this person on the other side of the screen, they're asking me what I did today. And I have to connect that to what I did in Dutch at my Dutch crash or powder spales all and somehow explain to them in English. They just, it doesn't work for the way children want to communicate. And so having a shared kind of artifact, if you will, a story or a puppet or something can help bring the child into the activity they're doing rather than getting them to report. I mean, children are not good reporting what they've done during the day, even in person, you know, you, I'm sure your daughter may come home from school. What did you do today? Nothing. Literally, you sat on a chair and you did nothing. Yeah, nothing. Did you read a story? Uh, maybe. Meanwhile, there's a photo of her holding a crocodile. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And you're like, wouldn't you like to tell me about that? But if you show her the picture of her holding the crocodile, she'd be like, oh, yeah, I held a crocodile <laughs> today and it was really scaly. But they need that concrete inter you know, to interact with the abstract. Because, yeah. yeah, actually, funnily enough, we got the Tony's box. And what we did, exactly what you say, is we've got characters for my family so that they're reading stories. We have the books here. I send pictures on WhatsApp and then they record the voice and we okay. kind of go through the stories that way. And how's that working? Great. You can see she favors one of my family members over the other <laughs> <laughs> don't they always well it's because they're it's very not more the one that really needs to be favored <laughs> well i think it's because my sister really likes to uh, like point out all the pictures and like chat about that and meanwhile my brother puts in loads of sound effects in his story <laughs> so okay there's a yeah, yeah it's very different so but that's really using irish with her or english no it's all english my irish would be kind of more irishism because much like what you just spoke about like i was raised in ireland as you might know like yeah. you know we're raised with irish and english but you know we don't use irish in, a, a lot oh especially in the east coast so i'm using certain phrases and counting and that kind of a thing but i'm not speaking full fluent irish to her because there's absolutely no point maybe when she's older we can both learn maybe together when she's older you can go and do irish immersion together Oh, we'll be back to that Gail talked soon and <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, so we're speaking about there the the family members and our community. So one of the aspects I would like you to ask about is I'd like to ask you about, should I say, is so, you know, there's over 180 nationalities here in the Netherlands. Um Marin's German, I'm Irish, we have a friend who's Dutch, you know, we know other people who are French or Canadian or all these different people. How important is it that we find a community with our own native language who are raising their kids with that language as well? So it's great to have that multilingual community. It's part of our family language discussion. Why am I still using English in front of your Dutch friends? But in order to, you know, in order to push themselves to use a language that they are not as comfortable with, we need to create what we call monolingual situations. And so, you know, in the early years, children will maybe be kind of equally proficient in their two or three languages. But the older they get and the more they spend time in one over the other, 
hours, which is traditional, you know, going to school, they will become less comfortable in the ones that they're not as strong in. And so, especially if they know that actually that one can kind of do everything they need to do. So I hesitate to call kids lazy, but I think that we are all a little bit linguistically lazy. Like even, you know, expats living in the Netherlands, we know we get ready to go to the cheese shop, we plan what we're going to say, and we get there and we start. And when they speak English, we go, oh, phew. Oh, that's so much easier. We, we all like to be in our strongest language. It makes us feel more competent. It makes us feel more secure. And it's just easier to communicate. And so when children have developed a dominance in one of their languages, that works in their wider circle, they will default to that one. So when I was living in The Hague, for example, I would meet very frequently parents who were like, oh, we tried to set up a Spanish-speaking playgroup so our kids would speak Spanish. And what ended up happening is all the parents were speaking Spanish together and the kids have all realized they all speak English at school, so they're all speaking English together. And, you know, and so you do need that kind of protected environment where the kids are, uh, have a little kind of positive pressure. Like, you know, grandma is standing there holding the ice cream and they've got to say, can I have the ice cream please in German and not in Dutch because grandma won't understand it in Dutch. And so creating that community where there's a kind of a, a positive pressure to communicate in the language that they are less exposed to is really necessary as well. Could you provide any examples of like effective like language learning, positive pressure or games even that could be incorporated? So what I, I mean, what I always say to parents to do is, I mean, you can't lie to your children or bribe them or any of those things things, but you can hire a teenager to do all those things for you. So just hire a teenager, 12, 13, 14 years old to come over while you're there and play with your child, you know, an hour a week, a couple of times in the language they need more exposure to. And you say to that teenager, you know, your job is to play in German. So you can say to my child, oh, I, I don't speak Dutch very well. You have to use German with me. And then you play the games they want to play and you read the books they want to read. And so it's positive because they're enjoying the, you know, the interaction and, you know, little kids love big kids and it just provides that kind of monolingual push that they need. Parents sometimes hire tutors. Tutors can be a good thing, but they can also be a bad thing because sometimes tutors take their job very seriously and they think that, you know, being a tutor means we have to do worksheets and spelling and things. And th that's not what you need. You just need interaction when they're young. I'm loving this idea of hiring an older kid. I just need to find someone. <laughs> if there's any <laughs> Irish teenagers out there in Amsterdam, <laughs> hit me up because I really need this. Wow. So okay. funny. We tend to overcomplicate all this, but then you say all these easy things and it just makes sense. Yes, of course, like hiring a tutor from our perspective. Oh, yes, it's going to be efficient. It's going to be the right way. There's going to be no mistakes. They're going to learn it from like everything perfect. But then, like you said, they don't stick to it because they don't enjoy it. They don't link this yep. to a positive time. They link this to pressure and I don't want to do this. I'm annoyed with this person. And then, yeah, hiring the neighbor kid and they just play whatever sticks on the ground it's right. going to have Taking a bigger impact on yeah. that. Well, and it's the same with, um, you know, Saturday schools or what we call complementary schools or heritage language schools. They're a really great place for children to be exposed to more of a language. And for example, German eventually to learn to, you know, read and write in German. But if the style of the Saturday school is such that the kids don't enjoy it, it's going to do more harm than good. And some of the Saturday schools are great. And some of them are like, sit down, here's a desk, do your work. And it's like, well, I just did that all week. So I don't want to do it again for three hours on a Saturday. The more successful ones are the ones that are kind of, they involve culture, they're transdisciplinary. So they might be learning, you know, some dancing and some food and a little bit of geography. And it's not just kind of sitting and replicating the reading and writing classes that they already do in, in school. And they are not really, most of them are not particularly much minded to do that on the weekend. Some kids are, but not all or not even many. Yeah, when you're talking about culture there, if you immerse them in the culture, like through, as you say, music and food and whatnot, is that kind of an added bonus because there's kind of new aspect, new novel aspect to it that, or does it need to be a consistent every single week, the same thing? No, no, it can be different things in a different week. It's just about showing that it's not just about using the words I want you to use, that there's a kind of a large body of things you get out of it. And so, you know, doing Irish dance in Irish, for example, which I don't even know if you can do. My, did, my daughter did Irish dance in the Netherlands for 10 years, but it was all in English. Yes. <laughs> Although I Hague. think he could have done it in Irish if he wanted to, but the demand wasn't there. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm sure not. Okay, interesting. So if we kind of take a little step back, so with, with parents in the baby and toddler kind of era, are there any, how, how can parents actually address any potential language preferences or resistance that your child may be exhibiting towards one of the languages? So that's a really individual question. It depends on the family language situation and what might be behind that resistance. Usually, I would say children who kind of start de developing a strong preference or to one or a resistance to the other, they're signaling that they can't do the things they want to do in the language that they don't want to use. And so, you know, what they really want is to talk about football, but they only play football in Dutch. And so they're just not going to talk in, in German at all because they've not got the language to talk about what they want to. And so you know, when we look at how bilingualism develops, it's like building a Lego structure and you learn language in a context and for a purpose. And so if I only play football in Dutch, my context and purpose for football is Dutch. I won't be able to talk about football in another language unless somebody helps me learn the vocabulary. And so as children are educated in the majority language, which is Dutch, and all their after school activities are in the majority language, which is Dutch, they may stop being and you know, what do they do at home with you? You know, they do their chores, they eat their broccoli, they do their homework. And so the home context becomes quite restrictive. They're not doing the kinds of things they want to do. And so they don't develop that capacity. And therefore, they don't want to use it anymore. And so it's really tuning into that idea of, you know, we learn language in certain contexts and for certain purposes. If a child is not wanting to use a language, it may be because it doesn't fit their needs, what, you know, their own proficiency in it. It's like the things I want to talk about, I can't, so I'm just not going to bother. And so it can be a signal that you need to tweak your family language plan, start getting more input in that language on a broader variety of topics and engaging in, you know, extracurricular activities and whatever it is that they want to do in that language as well. You know, when you're saying this, I'm actually laughing because it reminds me of, I don't know, 10 years ago or so when we were moving into our apartment and you have to do it up as you know, you have to put in your own floor, you to do everything here we were putting down you know those things at the end of between the wall and the ground and yep. my husband was just like yeah yeah the plinton the plinton the plinton and the thing was i genuinely could not think of the english word because i'd never <laughs> had to do this back yeah. home so i never kind of learned the word so i learned the word plinton and that became my word ever since and right. it took me a long time asking my friends to go can you tell me what is this english word because i don't even know it because i didn't learn it because i never had to learn it meanwhile yes. they're doing up their houses and they're going oh yeah the damn skirt and boards and i was like that's the word isn't it so it is a context we use the word plinth in english too we do so you can just call it the plinth <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Ignorant here. Okay. <laughs> no, it, it depends on where you are, but absolutely. Yeah. And so you see like, even when it's your, obviously your dominant language, you don't know all the words to everything. You know, you don't know the words probably to, you know, doing brain surgery. It doesn't mean you're not a fluent English speaker. It just means you've never done brain surgery. And so this idea that we often have about bilingual children should function exactly as monolinguals in each of their languages, completely false. You know, a bilingual is not two monolinguals or squished into one brain. It's it's a composite, it's an aggregate ability that has this underneath of the iceberg, everything they know, and then what they can do in the different languages will depend on what exposure they've had. And so I, I hear a lot of families who come to me for family language planning oh, I'm really concerned because my child doesn't sound like their cousin living in Spain. I'm like, well, your child is English, Spanish, bilingual living in the Netherlands. Of course, they don't sound like their cousin who's Spanish speaking living in Spain. They don't have the same context and purposes. They haven't developed the same vocabulary. And so we problematize bilingualism by expecting bilinguals to function as if they're monolinguals in each of their languages. It's not a realistic thing to expect for anybody, never mind for a young child. But, you know, even as adult bilinguals, we can do different things in different languages. Like when I moved to the Netherlands, the first thing I learned to do is feed my family, right? It's my first context and purpose. That's pretty common. My second was to call the gas, gas board and say, I think I have a leak because I thought I had a gas leak. Now that's not a common second context and purpose for Dutch. And so I bet that there are lots of expats living in the Netherlands who never learn how to say that in Dutch because they've never gone... Oh, I think I have a gas leak. And so, you know, we only learn language in a co in a context in which we hear it and a purpose for which we need it. And so we we look at our children's bilingualism as being modular. What do they need to be able to do? Let's build that. Let's build that. What are they not actually doing very well in my language or not wanting to do? Well, let's build that. It's the same for the, you know, the adults who move to the Netherlands and have to learn Dutch. It's modular. So I'm thinking now from a different context. So I, for your example of Spanish, if two parents are Spanish and they have their child, the migration and relocation affect a child's 
connection to their mother to their mother language since their home language would be one Spanish how would that affect them and what support system could be established in these kind of circumstances so I think it's just really being clear that the whole the home is for the home language but we need to pay attention to the quality of the input that they get as well and so the kind of language we tend to use at home with our children is quite restricted it has the goal of trying to get them to do what we want them to do it's quite repetitive you know a lot of go get your shoes where your shoes it's time to go to bed you know and so we need to think about the richness of input as well so we need to think about the you know the storytelling and the game playing and that as we're walking with our children we're describing our environment so that we're really developing their you know their language for lots of contexts and purposes and we need to keep in mind that if our child is going to school in a different language so say they're going to school in dutch but the home language is spanish they're going to learn to do mathematics in dutch they're not going to be able to do it in spanish unless we do it in spanish with them and so when the dutch homework comes home the math homework comes home you do it in spanish so that your children develop the ability to do mathematics in spanish and probably because you'll be better at supporting them doing it in spanish than in dutch too so their mathematics will be better and so it's really recognizing that the home as an environment has quite a restrictive set of contexts and purposes. School has a really wide set of contexts and purposes. And so we need to think about that in our family language plan. Otherwise, our children will start moving towards the school language because they could do so many more things with it. I'm just thinking here when you're saying about being so restrictive in the home, for example, with play dates, if another child comes over and they're Dutch from the school and the, that child comes in and both children are obviously going to be communicating in Dutch because that is their communication channel. And if your child turns around or if that other child turns around to ask you something in Dutch, you have to just not answer in Dutch and only respond in English and get your child to translate. So you can speak to the other child in Dutch. Okay. And if <laughs> I don't understand. But you need to say to your child, and when, they, when, when the play date starts, you say in Dutch to the little child. You may not know this, but I always speak to name of your child child in English. That's another language that we use together. So you're going to hear me using that language, but we'll translate for you to make sure you understand too. So you're valorizing your own language in that situation so that your child knows I can keep using English with mommy, but she'll use with Dutch with my friend. And what if there are families here who've just moved here, they have no Dutch whatsoever, and they're stuck in the, I don't even understand what this child is saying. You ask your child to translate. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Stepping back into the children's emotional well-being, as it were, what is the relationship between their mother tongue or their home language? What is that connection with that emotional well-being for the children's health? I mean, it really depends on their their journey to bilingualism but we do know that in situations where the home language weakens we call it language attrition where they start losing their home language it can have a negative effect, effect on the parenting relationship because parenting in a second language is not usually as effective and so we know it, it can damage the parent child relationship and we also know it can have a negative impact on their on their relationship with their extended family and so you know for example in, in a, you know in a in a parallel universe where english were to be endangered if your child child's English started kind of becoming less and less useful, you would go to Ireland and that your child wouldn't be able to play with anybody, but it wouldn't be able to communicate with their grandparents. And so it has a knock on negative effect on the family. There's a concept that we call funds of knowledge, which is kind of like the, the kind of the cultural piece that older members of the family in particular share with our children. And if, when families can't communicate their funds of knowledge to the younger generation, it becomes lost. And so you see that a lot in immigrant families and refugee families where there's a push to use the school language instead of the home language. And then you get this fracture in the relationships. And by the time the kids are teenagers, their parents can't have, you know, in-depth discussions with them about all the kinds of things you need to have in-depth discussions with about your teenagers. And they can't talk to them about their culture, their background. They can't discipline them effectively. And so you get, you know, all of this kind of negative side effects to the, the loss of the home language. So one thing also you mentioned there was identity, I guess, right? When, Absolutely, when because then they feel asked, they can't. Yeah. They feel they can't be who they are. One of the things you said there was parenting in second language can damage the relationship in that way. Whereas earlier you had actually mentioned bilingual. So, for example, myself, and my husband, so English speaking and Dutch speaking. That if we make Dutch a home language because everything outside is actually Dutch and school will be in Dutch as well. But would that therefore not affect him because he'll be speaking English in the house? So not necessarily. First of all, I'm assuming that your husband, like most Dutch people, speaks really good English. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Very good English. And so that's not going to be problematic for him. But we also know that your child's Dutch is going to continue to develop. So if when they're 12, he says, actually, I really need to parent the teenager in Dutch 
that will be possible because the Dutch will be fine. It's more, for example, if you imagine, you know, say a, you know, a Turkish speaking family in the Netherlands, they're often told to start using Dutch at home. So the parents start using Dutch when the child is four. And by the time the child is 12, their Turkish isn't good enough anymore for the parent to revert back to Turkish for parenting. And so then you have that rupture in the relationship and in the parenting. And so having the dominant language parent, your husband is the dominant language parent, use the minority language doesn't have the same effect because the dominant language will keep developing. It's all very contextual in family language planning. There's, people always say to me, what's the best way? I'm like, there isn't a best way because it depends on the status of the languages involved. It depends on the society. It depends on so many things that you can't ever say this is going to work because there are lots of variables at play. I haven't entered into the school system yet, but I'm just wondering, do bilingual families, as it were, so you have a home language or two parents speaking different languages, if the child goes to Dutch school, is there a potential need for additional like language support in school? Because I don't know about the Dutch school system, as I said, but like in Ireland, for example, I was speaking four languages because we had to learn French and we had to learn like another language. And it was that thing that it was like, it was too much. Is there usually a need for language support then for children going into school? So again, it depends on the context. So your child will go in as a Dutch speaker. They'll go in as a Dutch bilingual, but I would probably say that the vast majority of children who have one Dutch speaking parent don't have any problems in school system because Dutch is, you know, the majority language everywhere. Children who go in without a Dutch speaking parent, it's a different process. Obviously, they have to learn Dutch depending on if they've had exposure in crash or Pouters Beelzaal or anything. They may have some Dutch, they may have none. And then their journey really depends on how much their school understands the development of young bilinguals and how well supported they are. It doesn't have to be a problem. But often educationally it is because the school doesn't know how to best support those children. And so they don't work kind of in partnership with the parents. And so again, it, you know, there's no one size fits all. There are schools that are, will do a great job. There's a growing movement in the Netherlands called the Language Friendly Schools Network. And they're all schools that are really committed to understanding the bilingual development of children and supporting that relationship between the home language development and the development of Dutch at school or English. Some of them are international schools. And those schools, probably the results will be fine. In schools where they take an, a subtract, we call subtractive approach where they tell children they can't use their own languages anymore at school, then you're likely to have negative effects and those children are more likely to need additional language support later. Because we know if you if you actively suppress one of a child's languages at school, there is a kind of a, a, a very high potential for negative cognitive and, and linguistic impact. I, I feel like I'm rushing through these questions because I'm slowly processing all your information, yes. <laughs> trying to think of also the different aspects, because there are families who are like myself and Maren knew someone who I think there was like five languages involved or four languages. So yeah. that's quite complex. And we do know that, you know, children should always get enough input in one language to develop it well, or two or three. But when children's input is spread across five languages, there is a chance that none of them are functioning at the right level for their age. And that's obviously a negative situation to be in. And so, you know, it's kind of looking at then the multilingualism itself isn't the problem. It's that they've not been given enough of that child directed input to develop any of their languages to the right level they should. So you may have a four year old who has exposure to five languages, but can't speak any of them or understand any of them like a four year old should. That's problematic. That's very different than in the Irish context where you have English and Irish, and then you add French later and you add what the adding later is not a problem. But in those early years of language acquisition, birth to four, we do need to make sure that at all times one language is the right level for the age. And that if there isn't, then we need more input in, in one of them to make sure that they have a solid foundation. Otherwise, they're kind of building on a, you know, an, a, on an insufficient foundation. It's a lot because I, I, it's just, for example, we had a friend and one partner spoke one language, the other partner spoke another language. They together spoke a different language and then they're in the Netherlands. So that was four specific languages they had. And that was quite, yeah. Yeah, I was very impressed because their child was able to speak, I thought, and understand very well with everything. Yeah, then they were getting excellent and enough input, but that's not always the case. Always down to contact. Especially that. families that move around a lot and the child has, you know, you know, Spain and Spanish, Spanish and Spain for three years and then Dutch in the Netherlands for three years and then German in Germany for three years. And so we do need to keep an eye on their language development to make sure that as a three-year-old, they've got one language that does what a three-year-old needs to do. And as a six-year-old, they've got one language. Some kids it's two and that's fine, or it could be three, but at least one that's functioning at what we call an age-appropriate level. 
Yeah. Oh, all this info all takes so much pressure off me because especially with the Dutch, my daughter doesn't speak Dutch at home. She uses certain words. And now I understand in the context that she used them at daycare and then she has the word in Dutch and she uses it at home. And I was always worried about her level of Dutch, but they always reassured me, well, her Dutch is perfect. We don't hear any other language here other than here in this word. And I always had thought if she goes to school and she would need extra Dutch support, that it would be a failure on my parenting. And I would have failed in exposing her to the right amount of Dutch. But now hearing all your input really eases me a little and doesn't make me feel like a failure if she would need extra input. And this whole context makes so much sense, really. Yeah. This has been quite a lot of information, but it's given me quite a lot of food for thought that I think I'm going to have to pause while re-listening to this to be, and also I'm going to be sharing this with the husband to go, did you hear what she said? Can we take this on board? <laughs> okay, well, so I, we're going to wrap it up here with one last question. What advice do you have for parents who may face societal pressure here in the Netherlands, which can be a thing, to prioritize the community language over their own when raising bilingual children? So I think a little a little research based information goes a long way. I think that when you're raising your children as multilinguals, you need enough confidence in what you're doing to push back against the bad advice you'll get along the way. And so, you know, if, if you take your your daughter to school and they say, actually, we noticed her Dutch isn't really what it should be. We'd like you to stop speaking English and start speaking Dutch at home. You need to have the confidence of your family language plan and your understanding to say, actually, we know that the better her English is, the more easily she'll learn Dutch. So we're going to continue to use English with her. If you'd like us to use some Dutch resources at home, we can do that too. And so it's, you know, it, it's taking a firm but collaborative approach. Where I find parents end up straying from their course is where they don't know quite enough to be confident when they're faced with somebody telling them that what they're doing is wrong. And so they shift and go, oh, well, if you really think that's the right thing, and it could be anybody, it can be a pediatrician, it can be the consultati bureau, it can be somebody at the school, but a lot of times professionals actually don't know anything about the development of bilingualism and multilingualism. So if you become educated in the Netherlands to work in a crash or to work in a primary school or to work in a consultati bureau or to work with children in any way, there is no standard training you get on how bilingual children are different from monolinguals. And so they're just giving you their opinion, but they might be quite certain about it. <laughs> and so if you go, oh, well, they're so certain they must know something I don't know, you change your family language plan, and then you end up in a situation that's not ideal for anybody. And so whether it's, you know, reading one book, whether it's finding a good blog, whether it's, you know, whatever it is that gives you enough information that you feel confident that you know what you're doing and why you're doing it will help you have those conversations with people who are trying to give you bad advice and counter them with research. I always say that you could just say research shows that and people will back right off. <laughs> But whatever you want, have oh, oh, okay. Because if you can, you know, can demonstrate just through your words that you know what you're doing, they're more likely to respect that than if you kind of go, oh, well, do you think so? Oh, I've also, I've also been worried myself, and so I'm not sure what to do. And so I do encourage parents: you need to do some reading. You need to do some research because everybody kind of proposes that raising bilingual children is easy. You just do one parent, one language, and it's easy. And it's true that in multilingual societies, raising bilingual children can happen quite naturally without any plans. So, you know, everybody in India speaks multiple languages without a family language plan. But when you are a German-English parenting couple raising a child in the Netherlands, your community of practice is much smaller. And so the responsibility for the, the language development across those languages languages falls more on your shoulders. And the smaller your community of practice, giving your child lots of support, the more the parents have to think carefully about the about the languages of input and their and their plan. What do you want? Well, I really think this has been quite a, a lot and it's going to take me a while to process it. But I mean, thank you so much for joining us. I think we're going to be having you back on <laughs> to talk about different topics as well, because this actually is such a, a major concern for a lot of parents here, especially for those of us who are stay at home parents, especially under the age of four. We're very concerned because of the unknowingness of our children going to school school and choosing the schools. I mean, fortunately, there are bilingual schools here. There's the French and the English and so on and so forth. But helping us support us to make those decisions, like you say, even just using the phrase, well, research shows should hopefully give us the comfort of sending our child to a, a public school of whatever Dutch government supported school there are going that we don't have to be so concerned of sending them to the bilingual school just so that they can keep up their bilingualism. Absolutely. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And we will be looking forward to having you back on 
on in the near future to talk about the next 10 topics. I'm sure people might be reaching out to us about saying, hey, can you do a topic on this with her instead? So thank you so much. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Bye bye. So I guess we can all now (laughs) ditch the Zoom calls. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Not ditch them, but not ditch them, but knowing that they're more for the cultural and relationship development rather than the language perception as long as our children are so young it's that was a like wow like 5 30 every day i got a phone call trying to talk to my daughter and i'm like i don't get what this is but in my head i was like it's better than tv you know you're interacting there's a conversation that was i have to say this is going to be an episode where i think everyone has to pause repeatedly this is going to have to be put on all the instagrams like please pause this and take time to really ingest this that was so full of information that i hadn't thought of and a lot of key words and phrases used that now i'm kind of like okay like context Knowing the context element, that was a really, really great example. So good. Yeah, that was that made. And you know what? Like I said in in the interview, it's we sometimes put stuff on such a complicated level and then we forget about what's right in front of us. It's like, yes, of course, no context doesn't make sense. It's not going to stick. Or there, like I said, with my example where my daughter doesn't speak Dutch to another Dutch person, if I speak English to them. And what she said about the Russian, I was like, yeah. oh my God, yes, of course for children. It's like, oh, it's a secret language. We can only speak it at home under the blanket because no one can ever hear it and we don't speak it outside. It's like, yeah, we sometimes forget our children see the world without all this complication that we have. They see it, what's right in front of us. And like you said, if they cannot communicate what they want, they will not use the language. If they can talk about their soccer practice in English because they're only playing soccer in Dutch, then duh, yeah. we will not hear about it. Makes total sense. And it was also quite comforting to know. So there's many different people here that have, you know, moved over together with their kid or have a child here or like myself, I'm married to a Dutchman. And it's just the fact that like I have spoken and I have sought professional help as well about understanding the linguistics for our children to understand, because in my head, it was a case of, yeah, I care for my daughter, but 95 percent, I guess, is all Dutch then because Once you leave the house, that's it. And so I kept on trying to figure out ways to interact with more international people. So it's through the community center like Robberg, or if we went to the Jacardi Montessori school or if you're going to any of the other classes that are out there. Because I was thinking this is a great way. This is a great way. But oh, my God, I was also putting so much pressure on myself. And it was just constantly. So hearing her talk about, well, your husband, then he speaks English. So get him to speak English. And that will give an extra few percent (laughs) to try and kind of give that bit more support because it's so much on us to constantly try and figure out ways to actually help get a balance Because God knows like, me, who wants to lose that language. Yeah, it was such a good reminder of that. So I was never worried that her German would not be good enough. But now, of course, hearing that I am basically the only person speaking German to her and the English is always there because like you said, she's going to the movies and here in the Netherlands, they're not dubbed. So she's going to watch them in English. Her dad speaks English. She's so much more exposed to English with music, even everything than to German that now I'm like, oh, so I always thought, yeah, yeah, the German is like the safe thing. I don't need to. But now actually I know I have to really keep the German up with her and make sure she gets enough exposure to that. So this doesn't become her weak leg, as I want to say. But yeah, oh, I, I learned so much. I can just, yeah, repeat myself. I learned so much. I had so much aha effect. And what I also thought was so important to hear the whole understanding of bilingual children are not people who speak to, they're not monolingual. It's not two separate languages that they separately can perfectly speak they learn it different and they will always have different vocabulary from my german as opposed to someone who learns german as a third language in school or whatever they will always have this contextualized vocabulary and that was a big aha for me that yeah bilingual multilingual children are not monolingual speakers and they just have three monolingual languages separated from each other but it's this whole lego construct a construct, as Eowyn said, and that was good way to think and understand how the language is developed. Yeah, it's it's been a really great episode, and 
we are going to be looking into different topics. If you guys have any specific topics related to bilingualism or multilingualism, do drop us a message. You can leave us messages on Spotify, YouTube, our Instagram especially. You can equally email us on damnparentingpodcast at gmail.com. We're always interested to hear what our community are actually wanting to hear more about. But with that, we're going to wrap this episode up because I, I got to go and read my notes about what we've just done and accomplished. So Marin, take it away. Yeah, so every Wednesday, you know, we release an expert episode on this podcast. You can hear us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Every Monday, we try to release a damn chats where Eva and I are just chatting about a topic that has come up over the week. If you want to support this podcast, please make sure you give us a five-star review. Maybe write a little nice note to us. Drop us a line on Instagram. Share and like this episode. Just make sure we are in the conversation when you see questions popping up and you, we have an episode share this episode with the person so we get into the conversation and this podcast gets seen and most importantly heard of course that we will wrap it up we will hear you on the next damn chats on a monday or on the next episode with an expert which is going to be next wednesday and until then bye